Good afternoon and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Jay Newton Small. Jay is a correspondent for Time Magazine. She has been on assignment for Time in Iran, Iraq, Jordan, the UAE, Ethiopia, Haiti, Indonesia, Australia, Canada, and Europe. Closer to home, she covered the 2008 presidential campaign, traveling with then presidential candidates Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Newton Small has covered the White House, Congress, and the 2012 Republican presidential campaign. Before joining Time, she was a reporter for Bloomberg News. It is our good fortune to have Jay Newton Small as a fellow at the Institute of Politics, where in addition to managing a very busy schedule, she is writing a book which has as its working title, Broad Influence. It is my honor to introduce Jay Newton Small. to be here with my old friend Reggie Love, <laughs> who um, I was just chatting with Reggie. I think I wrote the first profile of you ever in print in uh, 2007, yeah. Right before Christmas. Yeah, and it was the, the in Time Magazine in 2007 because you were so nervous about it. Yeah. You were like, don't write anything mean about me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I said, well, and I said that I didn't want to take away, I, I was like, this campaign's not about me, this is about you know <laughs> Barack Obama and the message, but I think Robert Gibbs uh, his, his point was it, it will make him look more, it will, it will humanize the candidate. Is that, what, is that what Gibbs told you? That's, that's, what, how, that's how Gibbs sold it? That's how he sold it. Because I was <laughs> like, why does Jay keep bothering me about this, <laughs> this writing this article? Well, and I started it all because now you have an amazing book that's just come out. So let me introduce Reggie before we, before we start all the banter. Reggie Love, um, is you are a basketball and a football star. Uh, no, at Duke. I was a star. I played. I was on the team. He was a star. He was <laughs> totally a star. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and after graduating from Duke, you were going to go to New York. You were kind of on your way up to New York. And, uh, and he decided he would stop in Washington, D.C. and intern um, you know, for the summer and this, in this office of this new kind of senator from Illinois named Barack Obama. And, uh, and that internship ended up lasting a little bit longer than you thought. Yeah, well, uh, well so, and to be totally honest, I was I was playing football after college. I was playing. I yep. spent. You did like uh, a you, you were three summer, months. You were semi pro, right? The, or you were the pro? Packers, yeah, and I spent right. a year with the Cowboys. And um, you know, my mom had suggested that I take a an accounting course uh, my last year of college. And so when I'm in Dallas, I have I come up with this calculation of like how many snaps I would have to play and never in order to never have to work again. And when I finally calculated the number, I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to make that many snaps, so I should look for a different career. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, so he starts looking for a different career. He decides, I'm going to go you know, into finance, yeah. make money, right? So you're only yeah. like up to like Goldman or something in New York. Yeah. Well, this is kind of, and I don't know how many remember, this is like sort of the, the golden age of you know, I banking then, which you know, it's 2005, 2006. And you know, I, had, there were, I had classmates who were making just as much in their like annual bonuses as I was making like in a whole year playing football and I was like and they're gonna make that for 30 years yep well maybe not for 30 but you know they made it for a while <laughs> so you're looking at a lot of money you know money signs going up to New York you're thinking I'm gonna make it big make a lot of money for you know and then you stop in Washington and uh, and you intern for Barack Obama which does not let's face it pay well yeah does it pay at all uh, so I was I was a staff assistant, and I don't know who, how many people here have worked in a in a uh, in a member's office uh, on the hill. There's two, three. Two. So and there's someone in the back. So in in a uh, in a congressional office, you've got like the member of Congress, you've got like the chief of staff and a senior advisor and director of scheduling, legislative director, legislative correspondent. Communications director, communications assistant, speechwriter, <laughs> and then there's like staff assistant, and then there's intern. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I was a staff assistant, and I and I think when I started, I made, I mean maybe twenty eight thousand dollars a yeah. year, uh, and I and I lived in D.C., which is even I don't know how that even worked out. I don't really. <laughs> I, I don't think I was actually in, I must have been in the red. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I got there and things were, 
what I, what I noticed was that there was something special about what was going on there. And I would go, and Lauren Kidwell probably remembers this because here, is that uh, Senator Obama would have these town halls every Thursday. He and Dick Durbin would have a town hall and, and people from Illinois would come and visit. And, and the, the line that he would always say that stuck with me was that, you know, I would rather do what's right for the American people than worry about being reelected. You know, it was like, if, if I do the right thing and I don't get reelected, then I'm, fi I'm fine with that. And I thought that that was just like a very, uh, it, it, was a, it was a concept that I kind of thought never happened in politics. And I thought when I was, you know, when I was in college, I studied political science. I wrote papers on how, you know, the correlation between dollars raised and who wins a presidential election or a senatorial election. And it was just a, it was a refreshing point of view. And uh, so as a staff assistant, a lot of people say, well, how did you get your, how did you go from staff assistant to, you know, personal aid for the president? And it's like a, you know, it's a long journey. And to be totally honest, um, you know, when people see Barack Obama today, they're like, oh my God, 44th president, Air Force One, uh, you know, he's got, see, there's all these things and the nuclear football. But, you know, in 2006, um, you know, I, I would imagine not many people, well, you guys, if you guys are from Boston, you probably did know who Barack Obama was because he gave that speech the here. speech here, yeah. In, in, uh, in 04, but it, but. It sounded poly, I mean, like, I remember covering that speech when I was here in 2004 for the convention, and I bumped into then State Senator Obama doing a walkthrough with Robert Gibbs, who we keep mentioning he was uh, the spokesman for, for the senator and then became communication, was spokesman for the White House spokesman when Obama won. And it was like seven in the morning, we were doing a walkthrough in the convention center, and uh, Obama was like, hey, Jay, because we'd, we'd met each other within the Kerry campaign, and he was like, let's have breakfast, I'll give you a preview of my speech. And, uh, and I was like, okay, cool. And so he gives me this preview of his speech, and um, I filed the story, and it's like exclusive to Bloomberg, this preview speech, and my editor was like, this is so Pollyanna, like hokey, what is this, Red America, Blue America, United States of America. <laughs> he never published it. Like, he refused to publish this. <laughs> and he was like, no one's going to believe this. It's so hokey. Did you still have a job? <laughs> like, as, as Obama's <laughs> speaking, my editor emails me. He's like, he's like, you know, you know this guy, huh? Like, <laughs> but, I, but it's amazing to me that you, because you could, it's, he does sound Pollyannish, right? Like, when you hear him speak and he sounded, like, back then even in 2006, 2005. But, but people responded, right? You yeah. saw people respond. Well, it's, uh, it, it, for me, it kind of, it reminded me of sort of growing up in my church. Uh, it reminded me of my pastor uh, in Charlotte, uh, a small Baptist church, you know, and it goes up, you know, great cadence, great, great delivery, tons of passion. And, um, you know, and I don't know how many of you guys go to church often, but it always seems like the message that he's sort of, uh, the message that he's speaking is like directed right at you. Mm -hmm. It's like, you need to participate. You need to go out and vote. You need to educate your friends. You need to like take part in what is a larger conversation that a lot of people aren't participating in. And so, uh, no, it, it, it's definitely, it was definitely different, mm -hmm. you know, a, a very different approach. So you get inspired and you decide $28,000 a year <laughs> is worth it. <laughs> Living in the red is worth it. You're yeah. going to stay. <laughs> You're going to sacrifice the job at Goldman. Right. And I, and, I, and I told, and so Pete Rouse um, has kind of been my uh, Sherpa uh, for, for all intents and purposes. He's a former senior advisor to the yeah. president. And, and well, and he was chief of staff to Tom Daschle when Tom Daschle was the Senate Majority Leader. He was a senior, he was chief of staff to Barack Obama in his Senate office. Mm -hmm. He was a senior advisor on the campaign. He was a chief of staff in the White House. Uh, I remember telling Pete, I said, you know, Look, uh, I may not want to stay very long. I said maybe I'll stay two or three months, and I've and I've been in D.C. for almost a decade, um, and and in really to be totally honest, the first major challenge that I had wasn't a challenge at all. I remember the day Pete calls me and three other staff assistants into uh, the senator's office, uh, and it's like this amazing room. You know, it's big couch, big desk, eight by ten photo of. Thurgood Marshall, Muhammad Ali's boxing gloves, and a you know on a on a stand that are autographed, uh, a photo with him and um, uh, it, Nelson. It was a photo of him and Nelson Mandela, and you're sitting in this room and you're like, man, this is like, this is where 
like it happens. This is it. Yeah. So it's me and three other staff assistants and Pete Rouse. And, you know, you think you're about to like write a piece of legislation. <laughs> and he goes, look, I got a problem. And we're all kind of looking at each other. And he goes, you know, we have a problem in the mail room. And we all kind of look at each other and we're like, no. mail room, like <laughs> what, what kind of po what possible problem could there be in the mail room? Nothing interesting goes on in the mail room. Uh, and, you know, I kind of, you know, I look at everyone, I volunteer, and I kind of raise my hand. I'm like, I'm happy to, to help you with this problem. Uh, and so the, and the problem was very simple. So he gave, the, sen State Senator Barack Obama gave a great speech here in Boston in 2004. And people started writing him at the United States Senate before he was ever sworn in. So there was this whole pile of unanswered, unresponded to mail of, of almost six months oh, God. <laughs> uh, that needed to be sort of processed. And so I came up with just like a very systematic way of like using, you know, a, a service that sort of scanned documents, but at the sergeant at arms, an FTP site and uh, PDF, I mean, Adobe uh, PDF and Excel and sort of came up with a process to sort of digitize our, our, our mail system so that we could you know, process it a little faster, manage it a little better, and to help get rid of this backlog. And Pete, and it takes probably, you know, two and a half months or three months and, you know, a couple interns. And uh, Pete thinks that I can, he thinks I can like walk on water. He's like, you turn water into wine. This is like the most amazing thing ever. And I said, well, no, it's really, you know, it's really this FTP site and this, you know, in Excel and in and, uh, and Adobe that did it. I just sort of put it together. Uh, and from that day forward, Pete kind of felt like there wasn't a problem that I couldn't solve. So, uh, you know, <laughs> if it was, you know, anything from database management to setting up the Bluetooth in his car to, you know, anything <laughs> that had a battery, uh, he felt like, you know, if you put Reggie on it, he'll, he'll, he'll solve it. Uh, so you stay and then obviously history starts to un un sort of un unravel in front of your eyes right, or, or uh, surpassed before your eyes. Where you, Senator Obama then runs for president. Surprising. Um, were you surprised? I was surprised. Really? Yeah. Why? I, I, I just was, I, I never thought that uh, I would have been working for a guy who was running for president. Uh, and it was, you know, he'd, he hadn't been in the Senate for, you know, even for a third of his term. So it seemed, it, it you know, it was, it was a surprise to me. Okay. And I, and I, was, I wasn't very sh certain that he was going to be able to get his wife to sign up for it either. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, any thoughts on Michelle? Michelle Obama, she's, what do you mean? She's like the most beautiful, stylish person that I know. Uh, <laughs> and I don't want to get you in trouble here. Right. right. <laughs> well, I think it was funny. The president said it on Saturday night at the Correspondence Center. He goes, he goes, how is it that, you know, I've lost most of the dark hair on my head and Michelle still looks great. <laughs> she's untouched. <laughs> Smart thing for him to say. Yeah. <laughs> so you go, you decide to go over to the campaign with him. Was that a tough choice, or did you? Yeah, that was actually a funny story. And so, and so I was 23 at the time. I didn't, I never worked on a presidential campaign. I had worked like on a small statewide race when I was a sophomore in college. And you know, everyone was like, I want to be communications director. Or I want to be state director in Iowa. I want to be lead advance. And. Uh, all of a sudden, one day, Pete brings me to the office and he goes, so what do you want to do on the campaign? And I, you know, and I, and this is where I think uh, probably the smartest thing that I said, though at the time made me look really stupid, uh, I said, you know, look, I don't really know what I would be good at, uh, so why don't you make a suggestion to me and, and I'll go out and I'll try to do it to the best of my ability and if I'm, you know, and if I'm awful at it, don't fire me, just move me someplace else. <laughs> uh, and his suggestion was, he said, you should go on the road and you should handle stuff and be like the body guy. And, and I had no idea what a body guy was or what that meant. And to be totally honest, had I known at the time, I probably wouldn't have taken it because if you would have told me that I was gonna travel like 30 days a month and spend 115 days in Iowa and 89 in New Hampshire and 70 in Nevada, even though Nevada was kind of fun, uh, uh, I would, you know, it, it, it's uh, it it isn't necessarily the most appealing thing when you look at it uh, in in these little pieces, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
Now, I guess you could have ended up in some worse places. Or you, can, you could have been in Chicago. I know a lot of people spent time in D.C. Uh, but the travel's hard, and the travel definitely was not, was not easy. So tell, tell us, and I'm going to put, so Reggie, meanwhile, by the way, is an amazing photographer and, and sort of chronicled all of his travels with the president throughout the campaign. And, and, and you should pick up his book because it's great, and it has a lot of these photographs. So we're going to start. This is uh, them <laughs> on, the, on the campaign, on yeah. one of the little planes that they used to fly around in. Yeah. And Oh, no. Uh, so this is early on, and I always think about, I think this is really a funny picture because, uh, you know, I think he flew, we flew on that plane from, like, New York to California. Like, no <laughs> bathroom in it. Like, you literally had to stop and refuel in, Kans in, in, uh, in Kansas on the way to, to California. That's, like, how sort of uh, low-budget <laughs> the campaign was at the beginning. Um, and a lot of people kind of always think, they're like, oh, man, you and the president, you guys have this great relationship. You must be from Chicago. You must be from the south side. Or your parents must be friends or must be boosters or donors. And, you know, to be totally honest, I didn't know him. And I didn't know him from Adam when I came to work for him. Um, and to be totally honest, the day that I, the, when I became, like, his personal aide, I think for probably the first two months of it, I think he felt like I was more of a nuisance than I was a value add. <laughs> um, and I remember a couple of times when, you know, we're in these like really tight quarters and, you know, I'm kind of, I'm getting phone calls from everyone. He's supposed to be on a phone call right now or he's supposed to be in uh, a meeting or these five people are waiting. Where is he at? He's late. He's out on time. And so I'm kind of nudging him along like, sir, you got to go. X, Y, Z <laughs> person is already there and they've been waiting for 30 minutes and uh, one day he come, he turns to me, he says to me, he goes, look Reggie, uh, you were closer to my daughter's age than you are mine. Uh, I'm the person running for president here. Uh, you are my assistant. Uh, he has a good impression, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you're going to have to chill out. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of the job for me was really learning how to, you know, you know, be a nuisance, but not be a nuisance. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know what a body man is, let's, let's describe it a little bit. So you, 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 you stand next to him in events and you have a Sharpie at, at ready all the time yeah. and, you, and you receive, when he gets things from people, you get those things and yeah. you have to sort of deal with them. You're kind of, the, you know, basically, you keep them on schedule. E basically everything that he doesn't want to do you basically do. Um, <laughs> you hold so his BlackBerry. You hold his iPhone. You so it's like, it's like everything from his wallet to his personal device to you know briefing books to making sure that his luggage gets from the hotel to car to plane to car to hotel room, um, making sure that he eats you know three meals a day. Uh, if someone, you know. A, cousin or friend or whomever wants to see him in Cleveland, you know, you make sure that they're positioned or in the clutch or sitting in the audience in the right place and he knows where they are, he knows who they are and, you know, you just, you're kind of, you take in all the, the extra stuff. So President Obama wins, he becomes President Obama and you, sorry, this is, I, who, I skipped this photo. Oh, this yeah, is yeah. you guys just hanging out with Marvin. Yeah. Well, I, this is actually, this photo is a really good photo, mainly because, you know, I think the, the story I always tell behind this is um, if you look at this photo, you would say, I, well, there's the guy who's the president. There's a guy I don't know who that's Marvin in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really funny about it is that we're in a tent. Yeah. We're in a tent that has no chairs <laughs> in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. In Virginia, and it's basically I don't know. It's probably ten days before uh, before the uh, election in two thousand and eight, and I think um, I was probably with you guys at that point. And I think the thing that's really important is that you know while you're doing whatever it is you guys go off to do or what you're currently doing, like the people you're with and the people you're spending your time with, like you gotta have a little bit of fun. Uh, even if you're doing something that doesn't seem that interesting or you're in a place that seems kind of obscure or you're doing something that seems sort of redundant or repetitive, uh, you know, it's always good to be able to enjoy the people that you're with 
and, and to have a laugh uh, because it makes the journey a little bit more bearable, a little easier. When did the president discover your basketball skills? I mean, I played at Duke. I'm sure you watched <laughs> me play on TV or sit when, on the bench. <laughs> when, did you, when did you guys first? When did you guys first start playing? Yeah. So one of the uh, so Matt um, uh, Matt Rodriguez, who was our state director in New Hampshire, had a great idea. He said, "Look, what we'll do is we will have the prep, we'll have the candidate play basketball mm -hmm. with local firefighters and police officers in their morning game, and the, he'll get to earn their respect and ultimately they'll vote for them. Which is kind of ironic because we didn't win New Hampshire. Uh, and so uh, what, they would, what, what they decided to do, and you could also make the day a little bit longer. Because your first public event really can't start before 8.30 or 9 because no one will really be there. Mm -hmm. So they would schedule a basketball game with local people in New Hampshire at like 6.30. So we'd get up at 6, go to the gym, play for an hour, get shower and go. And so uh, we were playing with some folks from the New Hampshire staff, and you know, look, I was like 23 at the time. We were like, we were killing these guys. It was like, you know, we were up 20 points, and that's why you lost. Right. <laughs> why you lost New Hampshire? <laughs> you just created and, them, <laughs> creamed them in and, basketball. <laughs> and there's one play where you know I'm like in my help side defense. I like make a deflection. I run the ball down. And I like go up and I like dunk the ball. And I like run back down the court, and he kind of looks at me and he goes, look, you know, uh, Reggie, he's like, we want to win, but we want their support. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, I, I still think the president questions my jump shot uh, and my shot selection. I remember when the Duke basketball team, so I played at Duke, um, and Duke wins a national championship in 2010. So the Blue Devils come down, Coach K in the Oval Office, uh, Barack Obama in the Oval Office, I'm kind of giving them their briefing about, all right, you're going to turn left, and you're going to turn right, and the remarks are on the podium, and this is how the sequence is going to be, and, and the president kind of interrupts, and he goes, so, you know, sometimes we're playing, he's saying, saying this to Coach K, sometimes when we're playing, you know, Reggie will just take the craziest shot. <laughs> and, and then Coach K kind of responds back, he goes, no, no. Reggie does not shoot on my team. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, that's your problem. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think that, you know, look, my game is, I never, no one ever paid me to play basketball. I, I love the game, love to play, but uh, I, I will say that was the, the thing that actually did build the bond and friendship between the president and I. Uh, I, I can remember the first night, you know, it's a long day. And we were having a back and forth about the NBA playoffs, kind of like this time. It's like kind of this time of the year. And mm -hmm. uh, Chris Paul was playing for the New Orleans uh, Hornets at the time. And, uh, and Tony Parker was still in San Antonio. And, he, and I said, look, like, and I'm saying to him, I said, Chris Paul is the best point guard in the NBA. Uh, and he goes, no, Chris Paul is not that good. And I said, no, look, like I played against him in college. He's fast with the ball. He shoots great. He's just a great all-around player, best point guard in the NBA. And you know, I look at my email one night, it's about 12.30, and it's like Barack Obama, and I'm like, like, <laughs> this is like, this is gonna be like bad. Like he's either, something, something's missing, or like something's wrong, or he doesn't have something. So I open it up, and it's like, Tony Parker's stat line. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I reply back with Chris Paul stat line, and I go, you know, pretty, pretty good, but I still think CP is better. And that was like our, our first, like, non-work related communication, where we were just like not talking about scheduling or talking points or mm -hmm. logistics or uh, why he was doing something that he didn't think that he needed to be doing. So I was always surprised when I watched him play basketball during the campaign what a trash talker he is. I mean, he really <laughs> talks trash and like, he'll like haze everybody on the team. Like, is it, is it just that he's hyper competitive? I don't know, I think he's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I but mean, you don't see Axe talking trash to him when he plays basketball. Well, have you seen Axe Rod play? Yeah, he's not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, he definitely is a trash talker. And I have, a, and you, this, there's a great story in, in the book that I write and it's, it's still one of the funniest days of my life. Uh, we played a game in Iowa, and we flew to Milwaukee. We flew to Wisconsin later in the day, 
and the president or the candidate is about to go on stage. And he's standing off stage, he's being introduced by this woman who's a local person who's sort of talking about why she's supporting the candidate. And uh, I say to him, like, he's standing there hold, holding a the basketball, and I say, so, sir, uh, you know that's a girl's basketball. And he goes, yeah, I know it's a girl's basketball. And he throws it down the hall to Marvin, that's tall guy standing there. And Marvin's like 6'8". Marvin's his trip director, just to give you, like, he and travels a lot with the president. He throws the ball to Marvin, and he says to Marvin, he goes, he goes, hey, man, maybe this will help you with your game. <laughs> <laughs> and Marvin, you know, he's like, gets like, he goes, look, and I'll take, he says, I'll take trash talking from Reggie, but I won't take trash talking from you, sir. And he goes <laughs> on and on, and he, and he says to the, the president, he says to the candidate, he goes, well, you know, at least I didn't get my shot blocked by a 14-year-old. Oh. And the candidate goes, he was 15. <laughs> And it was his, his nephew, uh, Avery. And the candidate's about to like go back at Marvin. And then the curtains like open, the music comes on. They're like, uh, and the next president of the United States, Barack Obama. <laughs> and in the middle of this like heated trash talking moment, <laughs> he's like announced the stage. Uh, and he comes off stage and he goes, and he says to me, he goes, the whole time I was giving that speech, I was really fired up. <laughs> And Marvin. <laughs> so we redefined fired up and ready to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe so, I said fired up. He may have used another word. Because <laughs> he also swears a lot. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've seen him swear. So, so you decide you love it so much, you're going to go to the White House with the president, and, uh, and you're going to keep doing it. No, I didn't think I was going to go to the White House at all. No? No, man. I, the campaign was so long. It was you two years. Yeah, it, was it was two years. <laughs> yeah. 23 like, months, actually. And I had taken the, literally two months after, um, or two weeks after the election, I, I took the LSATs the, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. So I, like, was going to go to, I was, like, going to go take the spring off, go to law school, and that was going to be it. And we are, and shortly after the election in 08, uh, he's going to D.C. to meet President Bush. It's President elect meeting President President elect Obama, meeting President elect Bush, in D.C. And on the flight over, we're just we're shooting, we're talking, we're just talking sports. And uh, the my good friend Chris Duhan had gotten a new contract with the New York Knicks, and uh, and he'd had a good game. And he goes comes over to me. I'm on the plane. He goes, man. He said, man, Chris had a great game last night. He I guess, he's, I guess he really is worth all that money. I should probably take back all those mean things I said about him. Uh, and he kind of says to me, uh, so you're coming with me on this journey. On this, or you're coming with me on this, right? Talking about the, the White House. And, you know, and I'd already prepared myself, and I was going to, it's like, I'm not going to go because, like, I never really wanted to work in government. Like, my dad worked for Social Security, and I was like, I, was like, I really don't want to work for the man. Like, mm -hmm. that didn't sound cool. <laughs> uh, and before I can even, before I even realize what happens, I say, yeah, sure, I'll come for two years. And I'm like, look, I'm like, who said that? <laughs> uh, and so I guess that's what happens. The leader of the free world uh, asks you to come, you go. And uh, it was, I stayed for three years, and it was, it was probably the best experiences and the best uh, life lessons that I've ever learned. Uh, and I think Jay's sc scrolling through some of these photos, and uh, this is, you know, I, I would tell a different story about this, but this is a very great setup here. This is the Rose Garden. Press um, conference. Uh, and no, this is no. a bill signing. The bill signing, yeah. This is a bill building. signing. And, We're um, in the back. You're in the back. <laughs> and I'm, like, going out to check everything before I put the remarks on the podium. And so if anything was ever wrong at any of these events, uh, he would never go to like the press person or the grounds crew. He would always say, Reggie, why wasn't this right? And so I, the thing that I always learned was that uh, the right answer was always, yes, sir. Uh, and I'll do, we'll get that right next time because- um, Don't you know, debate him. <laughs> don't debate him. And, and it's really easy to say, to, to blame somebody else because usually, there's no scenario that just involves like one person. Mm -hmm. 
like especially when you're in these organizations there's there are hundreds and hundreds of people who are doing important jobs and sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't but ultimately uh, in my position uh, my position was basically to to take responsibility for anything that seemed to go wrong. <laughs> uh, Which happened a fair amount. Yeah. Hey, Good you thing know. you weren't there when Obamacare happened. Sorry. No, I was there. <laughs> you were there? Yeah. Uh, wow. Wait, when did you leave? So you, how long? I thought you stayed. I thought I you left. I left in December of 2011. Oh my God. Yeah. I meant when it went implementation. When it oh, went, right, when it right, went sideways right, right. during implementation. <laughs> I, was, I was gone for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah I was gone for that. That was unfortunate. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I was. Um, yeah. The website. Yeah, the website. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, do you have a story about this one, or should we? Yeah. Do? So this is actually a very interesting story here. So this was the first state visit, uh, and was preparation for it, and it's really a lot of work. I mean, we for for almost a month. We had meetings and walkthroughs and all different sort of um, uh, event preparation protocol, sessions. Protocol, yeah. Protocol. Yeah. And to be totally honest, we, I think we, we did an amazing job, mm -hmm. uh, except one thing. Uh, you know, the headline for the event was, you know, party crashers crash. Oh, the Salahis uh, crashed the party. State dinner. <laughs> um, and it was really an unfortunate thing because uh, everyone did an amazing job. A lot of work went into it. 99% executed without a flaw. And the one thing that goes wrong actually ends up being the thing that is actually still covered today and gets covered in India. <laughs> um, and yep. so, no, so, and I think the, the main story behind it is that, like, um, you know, there's a lot of work and a lot of preparation that goes into, into not only um, not only for him but all the people who work for him, uh, him being the president. And I think the main takeaway for you guys should be that um, there'll be a lot of moments where you're going to do a lot of things and put in a lot of time, and you're not going to get the outcome that you hope to have. Uh, and even when you don't get the outcome that you hope uh, for, you still have to put in the time and put in the effort to continue to go on. So now you, you've left in 2011. I know you went to Wharton. Um, and you're doing- Harvard a, of the South. <laughs> Basketball's not as good there. <laughs> and, you, uh, and you're doing environmental consulting, right? Like, um, no, I'm, I work for a financial holding company called Transatlantic. And okay. we are sort of, we're buying medium-sized companies that supply equipment and services to uh, utility companies and oil and gas companies. But you remain friends. Uh, you know, he was lucky enough to invite me to, that was USA versus Brazil. Uh, it was a, um, it, it was a preseason, or it was an exhibition game mm -hmm. at the Verizon Center. And it was funny because he went back to talk to Coach K and the team before the game. And, it, and the next time I saw Coach K, he says, he says, if he wasn't the president, there's no way he would come in to talk to my team at halftime, especially because they were like, it was like a tie game. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but uh, no, I think this is a great photo, and I was lucky enough to, to, for him to, to even invite me to go with. And uh, I think, you know, you, you have to enjoy, you know, the things that you do. And he definitely, uh, I think the funniest part about that is I got like 10 emails from people who work at Nike being like, why is he wearing all this Under Armour gear <laughs> on national television? He should be wearing Nikes. <laughs> I can imagine you got a lot of those. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to open up to questions in a minute. And, yeah. uh, and just so you guys know, the, you line up the microphones, which are around up here, to ask questions. And you need to keep it to at least two minutes per question. And you're, you have to identify yourself, please. And your question must end with a question mark, <laughs> which are the rules of Harvard. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to kick off. <laughs> I'm going to kick off the question answer session with a question that was planted by David Axelrod um, when I saw him uh, last week, and and I said, you know, Ax, I'm going to be interviewing Reggie for the forum. What should I ask Reggie? And Ax said to ask you about a story involving Hillary Clinton. Um, <laughs> so, and I kind of remember this, but we we differed on our recollection. I remember this being at the Sioux City Airport in Iowa, he remembers it being in the New York City airport. And, um, but it was after, so the story is Billy Shaheen, uh, who is Jean Shaheen's husband, um, uh, at some point said something incredibly insulting to the president. He, he, he sort of hinted that the president might have dealt drugs in, uh, when he was at Columbia University 
He immediately apologized, you know, resigned from the campaign. The Clinton campaign condemned his remarks, and, and Hillary said that the next time she saw Barack Obama, wherever it was, she would personally apologize. And so they're on the tarmac. Was it Sioux City or was it New York? D.C. It was in D.C. We were both yeah. wrong. Okay, so both Axe and I misremember this. D.C.A. Um, and so, so uh, you're in, and, and Axe is there, um, you know, and both staffs are kind of uh, in the terminal, and they're, so they're seeing the, the candidates meet on the tarmac, but the only people who could actually hear what the candidates said to each other were Huma, who is Hillary's body person, and Reggie. And so Axe said to ask you, because apparently we, the, the legend goes that things got incredibly heated. It looked like they were screaming at each other. So, um, so <laughs> Axe. <Looks like. laughs> yeah. So Axe said to ask you to put you on the spot and say what exactly was said that day. I, look, I think uh, <laughs> I think the so we're in DCA uh, in Washington D.C. And, and to Jay's point, uh, there was uh, you know some comments that were made about the pre about the candidate at the time that were a little unsavory, and so he had he addressed it to her. And she kind of said, look, I had no idea and that he was going to do that, and I'm really sorry about it. And, uh, and, and you know, and I think um, for the most part, I think, you know, at that point in time, I think uh, maybe someone felt that the apology wasn't sincere enough. Uh, and look, and I think this is your brand, and uh, these comments that are made, you know, have a huge impact. And... You know, I, you know, like your kids like read this stuff, and you know your wife reads this stuff, and so I think, you know, it's one thing to differ on, you know, your policy in Iraq, but it's another thing to, you know, have uh, sort of these sort of libel things mm -hmm. being said about you. And how did she take the request for an apology, more of an apology? Yeah, uh, you know, I don't, she wasn't too too thrilled with it. She got <laughs> it was definitely very animated, to say the least. Uh, uh, you know, it was kind of awkward because, it, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever been around when, like, your parents are fighting <laughs> and they, you're there, but you probably shouldn't be there, but they're already kind of at it and you're just like, maybe I shouldn't really be paying attention to this, so you're kind of trying to act like you're not <laughs> watching it. So, you so like, like, yeah, so man, I was like, man, that was a great event at the convention center, huh? <laughs> She was like, yeah, this is getting serious. She's like, should we break this up? <laughs> um, so no, I'm going to open it up to questions, and, uh, and yeah. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ben Bolger, and I just have a, a question about uh, dealing with uh, challenging experiences with the president. Um, uh, for example, I think once you might have misplaced his briefcase temporarily. I'm just wondering if you could kind of give us a good story uh, <laughs> like that, and like, you know, how did you, re you know, everyone's human, how did you resolve a setback that you had with the president and yeah. had it work out? Look, I mean, I, I like start sweating thinking about that day. And so that's a great question, Ben. And so when I tell the story, sort of my first really big mistake um, was the day before the South Carolina debate, uh, which was the, one of the first debates in the primary, I leave his bag that's left in the car in Florida and I don't realize it until we're like speeding down the tarmac uh, to take off. So I, one, I call everyone I can, I'm emailing people, hey, here's the bag, can, how can we get it to South Carolina, can we FedEx it, can someone drive it, like is anyone flying, like what are all the options out there? Uh, and then there, so, so part one is just like trying to like solve the problem, right? Um, now, the real solution to the problem would have been to not have left the bag there at all. Um, and so then the other part of it is uh, when we land, he, he says, hey, you know, Reggie, where's my, where's my bag? And I'm like thinking to myself, well, okay, I think the bag will be to the hotel tonight before we get there. I think. I'm not 100. You know, you know something could happen, a plane get delayed or so I'm like, so I can tell him the truth and say, you know, look, I left your bag in Miami. Or I can say, uh, yeah, no, it's in the other car. I, I'll grab it when we get to the hotel tonight. And <laughs> I went with uh, a version of something in between, which is like, you know, it's en route. 
Uh, <laughs> and don't ask. <laughs> and he says, well, "What do you mean it's en route?" I said, "Well, it's en route to the hotel from Florida." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, why is it not with me here?" And I go, "Well, you know, we got left in the car, and and I we I solved it. It's going to be there. And uh, later that day, we're in the campaign headquarters and." in Columbia, and he kind of asked one of the staff members for a room, and he goes, Reggie, come in, I'm gonna talk to you, he sits me down, and he kind of says, look, um, you know, I, I, you know, you have one job to do, and if you're not up for doing your job, then it's gonna make it really hard for me to do my job, and I'm sure there are a lot of other people out there that would love to have the job that you have. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I go think to myself, yes, sir, like, you know, I, this is a terrible mistake. I'll never make it again. I never did. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, there are tons of, I mean, I can, I can, I mean, I have a whole list of mistakes that were made. You know, everything from, you know, pages of a speech being left out of the, the binder to teleprompter operators like falling asleep during the middle of a speech to, <laughs> you know, the teleprompter glass breaking to, no rain sites for events. Uh, we had this awful day, and uh, oh, was that in the one in Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. No, I was oh there. That was terrible. They like canceled the World Series <laughs> the, the same day, and we had an event outside. <laughs> it was pouring rain. I mean, like teeming, and there uh, was, it was just oh, it was terrible. And he wakes up in the morning, down. and he goes, <laughs> "So Reggie, what's the rain site for this?" <laughs> it's no rain site. And I'm like, "Well." You know, there were no, I'm trying to explain it to him this elegant way in which, like, there's no rain sight, but we have a really good reason as to why there's no rain sight. Uh, and <laughs> whatever that reason we thought was, was not good enough for him. Uh, and so he doesn't eat breakfast. He doesn't put on a suit. He doesn't pack his bag. We get in the car. We drive straight to the event site because people are outside waiting, and they're waiting in the rain. Um, and it's cold, and it's freezing. It's like a week before it election was day. Really cold. And he's like, you know, people are going to be sick with like pneumonia. They won't be able to go vote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's pouring down rain. It's freezing cold. He addresses the crowd. Uh, you can't like you can't even see. Which, keep in mind, you're not allowed to have an umbrella because Secret Service. No umbrellas. No umbrellas. Right? No umbrellas. So it's pouring rain, and they there's no no protection. Yeah. And he chose to go out without an umbrella too. I think and in solidarity. He went out without an umbrella. And, um, and during the remarks, I, I walk into the whole room. The whole room's like nice and warm and dry. <laughs> and I kind of say to guys, I'm like, look, man, when he gets off the stage, man, you guys, are, you guys don't want to look dry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so true. Uh, Do you think he's changed since, you know, you knowing him as a senator and then knowing him as president? How much, how different is he? I mean, I think, you know, I mean, they're, they're obviously, obviously the physical differences. Uh, um, and I think, you know, I think the job takes a toll on you. And I think, too, that the job takes a toll mainly because, you know, when things like kind of get to his desk, they're kind of like, you know, the options are like bad and worse, right? <laughs> uh, and so I don't think as a person, I don't think like, um, I think his sense of humor is still the same. I think um, the way he interacts with people is still the same. I think uh, I think he's definitely grown in a lot to being president, and like you know, I think he's always had a, an immense amount of respect for the office. Um, but I do think that you know there is definitely growth because you're doing a lot of things for the first time. You know, like how many. You know, arrival ceremonies have you been to when you are a junior senator from Illinois? How many, you know, uh, uh, multi-country negotiations have you, like, <laughs> been through, mm -hmm. you know, as a junior senator from Illinois? So I think you definitely grow and learn and evolve. Uh, and I think he has, but I don't think, in, I don't think it, at his core, I don't think he's changed. I think he's been waiting. <laughs> Hi, uh, Reggie, thank you so much for coming to share with us. My name is Amandla. I'm a joint degree student between the business school and the Kennedy School. Uh, awesome. So one, I think it's so fantastic to have the president humanized in a way that I think is sometimes very difficult when we think about the presidency as a high office. 
I'm curious how the president processes really difficult issues that he has to take a stance on. Um, what comes most immediately to mind is what's happening in Baltimore now, where the president has to represent all of America, but is a black man in America today. <coughs> how does he process what he has to say at times like this and balance those things? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very, well, I, I'll break that into two. And Amanda, that's a great question. Um, as well. And what are you focusing on in your MBA? So, uh, general MBA here general at MBA. HBS, okay. uh, but I'm from Kenya, so I'm really interested in development. You're from Kenya? Mm -hmm. Nairobi? From Nairobi. Oh, you, wow. went, you went with the president, right? When he, when he went as a candidate. I did not go on that trip. Did he, go on that he, trip? he and Michelle went and they got, they yeah. said he tests. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I didn't it go. was a great trip. Yeah, we um, were there. Yeah. But to her question, though, um, I think two parts of it. I think one as a whole, and I mean, he deals with a lot of tough decisions all the time. And then there's like this whole other thing, which is Baltimore and race in the country. And I think for, you know, very tough decisions, I think he does a very good job of taking in a lot of data and a lot of points of views. Um, you know, he will listen to, to everyone's point of view on an issue, regardless if it's contradictory to his or not. Uh, and I think that that's very different from some leadership styles. I think some people, who have very tough decisions want to hear all the supporting reasons why the thing that they're going to decide is like the right decision. Um, but I think he does a very good job of saying, hey, well, you know, what are the counterpoints to this and, you know, how, how hard can they be broken down and is there a middle ground? And sometimes, you know, he's even, he even already has his mind already made up, but he's still has the wherewithal to listen. I, I remember a day when they were trying to take a decision on the auto bailout, and he asked like a junior staffer in the room who was probably like 27 at the time, he said, hey, what do you think? Uh, and the guy was like, it was Brian Deese. I was gonna say, that Bri Brian was 31 running the auto bailout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, he ran the whole auto bailout. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, and I think he just does a really good job of bringing in a lot of different perspectives. In terms of Baltimore as a whole, I think his comments are, have, been, have been spot on. Um, I think his perspective and his message uh, probably is tailored a little more from his own personal experience as, you know, he's, he is a black man who grew up here in, in the United States. Uh, and I think he probably, he has a little more um, sort of personal sort of experience alongside of it more than, you know, probably a lot of the other people who are senior advisors in, this, in the administration. Um, but I think, look, uh, it's a difficult time where we are today, but I think he also believes that, you know, we've come a very long way. Um, technology today um, affords us the ability to for people in Boston to feel like they know what's going on, like on the grounds in Baltimore, right? Like, and not like three or four days later, like instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that these you know incidences are are good opportunity for us to grow as a country. And I think you know he's done a lot of you know interesting things around. Uh, looking at the different processes and how uh, police officers are engaging with uh, uh, with potential suspects, the training that they go through, uh, uh, all the different protocols that they're taking. Um, I think he's just done, they've done a really good job sort of analyzing it and they've had the opportunity because of Ferguson, because of uh, what happened in New York City, uh, Eric Garner, because of Trayvon Martin, uh, and even though those are hard things to, uh, to swallow and to see, um, I think you know, he's been out in front sort of trying to figure out how can we make things a little bit, a little bit better. Um, now granted, like trying to make things better for tomorrow does not necessarily help us feel better about where we are today. I'm John Clark Levin. I'm a second year master in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. I'm wondering, some presidents have been very guarded, even with their intimate staff members, while others 
let their hair down more. FDR was famously very reserved even around people he was close with, whereas Lyndon Johnson infamously met with people while he was in the bathroom. So I, I'm wondering, from your experience of President Obama, what were the ways in which he could let his hair down around you and other close staff members, and what were the ways maybe he was <laughs> private and guarded even around you? Well, I definitely, I, I'm definitely pretty certain he didn't have any bathroom meetings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I think I saw that on an episode of House of Cards, though, too, which is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't give him ideas. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, how is he sort of, how, how does he interact on a personal level with, uh, with the staff? I think, you know, he has like a pretty good sense for, you know, cause his daughters are relatively young. Uh, so he, he has a pretty good sense of like pop culture and entertainment and he watches and reads like everything. So, you know he'll have a conversation about, you know, what he thought, you know, the last episode of Mad Men really meant, or he'll talk about, you know, uh, sports with, you know, with Dennis McDonough, or he'll talk about, you know, whatever is out there. I mean, he loves, I mean, he, he consumes, like, so much stuff that, like, I'm always surprised. I remember, like, one day, like, I got an email from him at like one o'clock in the morning, and he said like, "This is in the White House, or this after? in the White House? In the White House is mm -hmm. the president of the United States." And you were there too, or you were? And, I'm, and I'm working there. Okay. And he said, um, "You know what's up with these buried life guys? Like, <laughs> and the buried life were these guys on MTV who were going around trying to. They had like a bucket list of all the things they wanted to do. And I don't know, like he's. I guess he's watching the buried life at like <laughs> what, whatever time and." He sends his email, and I said to him, look, you know, your team decided that it wasn't worth you, like, meeting with them or bringing them by. And he goes, well, he goes, let's bring them by anyway. I don't care. He's like, I'm president. I want to bring them by. <laughs> so, so he emails me this. This is like a <coughs> middle-of-the-night exchange of, and so, you know, so that's like a small example that I can remember in which, you know, and I don't know if you guys even remember this show or, or not, but like he's just, you know, he he consumes a lot and he's he's very, you know, engaged with people around, you know, issues that are not just about policy, um, media, entertainment, sports. A lot of sports. A lot of sports. Hey, Reggie, uh, thank you very much for coming. My name's Russell. I'm a first year law student and a former body man for a member of Congress, so a little PTSD. Um, <laughs> I lost a bag myself. You never get over it. Yeah, no. Um, so in light of that, I'm, I'm wondering, you had a lot of experience and a lot of time with incredible uh, men and women, whether it's you know Pete Roush or the president, obviously, and, and all these people that you can really soak up a lot from. But I'm wondering how you were able to, or potentially failed, to toe the line between sort of professionalism and you know seeking out these individuals as whether it was a mentor or sometimes you know the president's referred to as like a little brother. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, how you went about making sure you didn't cross over that and ask an inappropriate question at an inappropriate time, or but at the same time still you know soaked up as much as you possibly could in your time. You know, I think, and I honestly think there, I don't think there are any inappropriate questions uh, if they're phrased properly. Um, um, I, I remember back in 2008, it's like, like August, and this is like pre-TARP, uh, and he's like on the phone with Bush like every day, and he's like, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do about, you know, these banks. And He's like working, it's like a bipartisan effort to working to figure this out. And it was like, we're in the middle of a campaign. And I'm thinking to myself, and I say, you know, sir, like, um, like I'm just like confused a bit because like in theory, if things get really, really bad right now, like it would probably make it a lot easier for you to get elected in November. And he goes, no, that's, no, that's probably like a very fair assessment. Um, and this is, so this question is basically going like, this is like a question that's like, so why are you spending so much time talking to like President Bush? 
And he answers the question. He says, look, you know, like the people who are going to be the most affected by this are going to be not the people who work in the banks. There's going to be the small businesses that don't have access to credit, that can't make payroll, that can't, you know, go out and, you know, procure whatever supplies and equipment they need in order to, to provide their services to, to ultimately, like, put food on, on the table of, uh, of middle class citizens. So I, so I think in a form of a question, I think that's totally fair. I think there are other scenarios that I definitely have, I probably did not do that great of a job towing the line, but it has less to do with sort of the mentoring aspect and more to do with, you know, like when you are playing golf or basketball or you're competing with somebody, like, you know, when are you like competing against like someone that you're in competition with and when are they your boss? And I think that's like a very hard thing to, to, to get right sometimes. And I've definitely, you know, I've like had to apologize and like, <laughs> and I didn't mean to yell at you about that call, but like, I was really like heated at the time. Um, and, and I do think that, and my biggest point around this too is that um, there's like no, Coach K used to say this all the time. They're like no such thing as stupid questions. They're just like stupid people who don't ask questions. Um, and it's easy, especially like you guys are like all like probably really smart and experts at whatever it is you're studying and teaching and professing. Um, and you know, the hard thing to do, I think, is to let someone else know that like you don't know everything, that you, you know what, like you would like more information about something that you know what, uh, I probably could go and do a little more research on this because I'm not really up to speed on it. Um, and I think that that's like where you like have like the most amount of growth uh, in places where you either don't agree with people and you are asking tough and challenging questions and you're having those, those dialogues or places where you know, you're having conversations where you're uncomfortable because you're, you're not necessarily the most educated person on the topic. Uh, and I think you can just, I mean, and I, I think that was, for me, probably the best part um, about most of my experiences is that, you know, I felt uncomfortable all the time because I was, like, typically, like, the least smartest person <laughs> in most of the meetings. <laughs> Last question here. Hi, my name's Ahelia. I'm an undergraduate student at Wellesley. Um, I was very lucky. I got to work at the Office for Public Engagement at the White House um, during the fall. And How far is Wellesley from here? Uh, I, came a, I came a ways. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to hear you talk. Um, <laughs> and I saw the great things that were coming out of the administration, like My Brother's Keeper and the Council for Women and Girls and all of these really wonderful initiatives. And every day I would, you know, very religiously read Politico. It's a very DC thing to do. And no one was talking about the good work. How does the president deal with the polarization of the media, the fact that people go to the media sources that confirm their views, not the ones that challenge them? How does he deal with the fact that in today's world, the White House press briefing room is really, really not that relevant? Um, well, I think there's a <laughs> no, couple I feel things. inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that's probably the reason why people are spending like multi-billion dollars on campaigns. <laughs> uh, so that they can like basically have their own media outlet. Um, and I also think that too, I think he understands that, look, it's, you know, people, people it's competitive. Like the, the, the news landscape is more competitive today than it has ever been. Um, and so, look, there is, sometimes there, there, you find yourself when the things that are like really driving click-throughs and subscriptions and viewership are not the warm, fuzzy success stories. Uh, and I think that, you know, I think he gets it. I think, um, uh, I mean, I get it. But how do you get it. people involved if all they hear is the bad stuff, if all they hear is the fighting and not the hope? Well, I think, I think, that, I think that is part of the story. That is the part of the story about being involved. Um, you know, when you see that there is this much gridlock and fighting and uh, um, sort of uh, 
stagnation, it means that like more people need to be involved in the process, but uh, and more people need to become you know educated and engaged in having their own dialogues in their own communities about these issues. Uh, I mean, because ultimately, you know, none of these issues are like won or lost on CNN. I mean, they're won and lost in like living rooms and in churches and in town hall meetings and in places like here. Uh, this is like where, this is where it happens, right? Now, I think the media tries to, you know, they try to come up with storylines to help sort of move people in a certain direction, but you know, it's really up to us to, to dig down deep and to look uh, uh, very analytically at what's going on and what are the things that are important to us uh, and what are the things that are going to make a difference to us, not just look at the things that are being fed to us. Um, and, you know, I think that, that's hard, you know. It's a very hard thing to do. We have short attention spans and, you know, there's a lot of things that are competing for our time and our attention. And I'm sure everyone's got three devices and, you know, you've got your friends and girlfriend or wife and kids. And it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing. To, it's a hard thing to do. But I think when you, uh, when you get to the core of it, when you get down to sort of the basic uh, needs and necessity, which are, you know, people want a chance to be, they want a chance to, you know, get a good education, have an employment, uh, have secure long-term security financially and uh, and with health care and you know they want to have the chance to live the American dream if people feel like they have that opportunity uh, they'll be in, engaged and involved uh, you know for years to come but the moment you know people feel like that thing is no longer attainable then you know people become more and more disenchanted and and I think those and that that's also the moment when people have to sort of turn in and and dig a little deeper and, and, and work a little harder uh, to, to help get us back on course. So last question, you seem up close and personal what it's like to be president. Would you ever run? For president? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no Not an advertisement for it. <laughs> um, look, man, you've seen, you've seen up and close. Would you run? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I enjoy this, the view that I have. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Reggie. Oh, have you been waiting? I'm sorry. You didn't see it at the mic. I'm sorry. Okay. My name is Malik Jabuti. I'm actually a high school senior. Um, so what do you think has been Barack Obama's biggest accomplishment as president? Um, I mean, I think what will ultimately be, you know, I, I think health care will, will, will be looked at like the New Deal. Uh, I think ACA will be the most historic thing that has happened to our country in a while. Uh, I know a lot of people argue otherwise, and I can, I'm can sure I can find 100 websites that say the opposite, but me personally, um, you know, I think uh, hands down, I don't even think there's, yeah. I mean, it, it'll, it's the most important thing that's happened in the last three decades. Well, thank you so much, Reggie Love, for coming to speak with us. And Power forward my presidential education, if only to read the part about when he catches Reggie with a girl. <laughs>